Welcome everybody. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jane Fitzpatrick. I'm the Facility Manager of ANFFQ and we are delighted today to um, have MEP with us today to talk about Zeta Potential and the wonderfulness that it can give to your samples. Um, so we have uh, two members from the MEP here today. Ashish Kumar is, our ex is their expert on rheology and he's also this product specialist for all of the Anton Parr um, measurement range. And we also have Luke Baker, who is hiding in the corner. So he's our local rep. So if anybody needs to talk to him about other things that uh, MEP do, he's your man. Um, so I will stop talking very quickly and hand over to Ashish. We're going to have um, about 40 minutes of presentation, and then it's open Q&A. Um, and we do hope that you give us some uh, really good questions so that we can get as much out of this seminar as possible. Um, also to let you know, it is being webcast, so it is open as a webinar. Um, those of you who are looking in on the web, if you want to ask a question, please just send that via chat and hopefully it'll make its way down to me and I can ask the question for you. So with that, thank you, Ashish. Thank you, Jane. Can everyone hear me all right? Um, yeah. Yes. Hello. Uh, this is Ashish from Hi. Nice to meet you. Uh, all right. So... My name is Ashish. I'm the rheology product specialist at MEP Instruments, but uh, I'm in charge of the material characterization portfolio for Anton Pa. So, uh, Zeta uh, Rheology, so I'm a rheology product specialist because that's my main instrument that I'm in charge of, but under that, I also have Zeta Potential as one of my uh, products, small angle x ray scattering, uh, particle sizing, scratch testing, indentation coding thickness measurements, and come next year, AFM. So all of the material characterization suites, really. But today, I'm here to talk to you about zeta potential measurements, uh, particularly of surface charge. So not so much colloidal systems, uh, but I will talk a little bit about them. So first off, who was here for the colloidal stuff? OK, you, should, you, you can leave if you want, but it's OK. I'll talk a little bit about that because we actually do products that do both solids and colloidal systems, but they're two separate instruments. So, but I'll talk about the theory behind why they're different anyway. Uh, so, a show of hands, who's actually doing zeta potential measurements? Don't be shy, show of hands, who's actually doing zeta potential measurements? Yep, yep. So, about five people, that's it. Everyone else is, this is just general interest? You will. Everyone else, just curious. Is that it? All right. <laughs> I'll try to make, I'll try to make. Yeah, <laughs> I lied. OK. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what Zeta Potential is and how it can help you, what you could, what you could use it for. Maybe you haven't thought about using it yet. I also said I wasn't going to cross this line, but uh, what you can use it for uh, and um, Maybe if you're not doing it at the moment, you should start doing it. So this is what we're going to be talking about. We're going to do a bit of history as to where zeta potential comes from, where its origins start from, charge formation, how things actually get charged, zeta potential, so that's exactly why we're here, El different electrokinetic effects, so how we actually detect a charge or a zeta potential, streaming potential and what that actually means, characterization techniques, so what are the different ways to measure it, Applications, which I think is the more fun part of this talk, and then lastly, Q&A. But there'll be a lot of chance to do Q&A. I think it's not very easy for me to put a talk together that will cater to everyone's interest. So I guess the Q&A is going to be really fun where you say, I want to measure this, and I'll say, no, you cannot. Okay? So a bit of history. And if you have questions, just ask during. That's, that's okay. Just put your hands up, ask during. Um, and there are, by the way, so the people who are joining in on the webinar, I'm sorry. You don't get this, but I brought a few of these Zeta guides. They're free. They're a pretty cool handbook. I put a lot of them in the front so that people would come and sit up front, but everyone's just taken them and then gone to the back. So uh, it's a free book. It's not too thick, but it goes through everything. In fact, a lot of what I'm talking about here will be in here, but there's a lot more math and equations in here. If you want it, you can go online and order it for yourself as well. If you do a teaching course on this, you can order a whole box. I'll, there, there are links for this at the end of the talk. OK, so a bit of history. Uh, the first detected it when you put clay colloidal particles into an uh, electric field. So Ferdinand Friedrich Rius, 
observe this when you put a charge over colloidal systems, you can see clay particles move in a field. On the flip side, you could also cause fluid or an electrolyte suspension to move through a clay plug when you apply a charge. So this was the first, one of the first few times you actually saw the movement of material as a result of charge or charge causing the movement of material. Uh, in 1859, they coined the term streaming potential for the first time. So in 1879, Helmholtz set what is the electrochemical double layer theory, and we'll talk about this in a, in, in a few slides, uh, tried to describe a correlation between the EDL and streaming potential and where it comes from. Uh, Jean-Baptiste came up with calling it the zeta potential. Well, not really, but he assigned the Greek letter zeta to it. And 1805, Schmoll Luchowski, not an easy name, but uh, refined the equation and actually it's put together now as a Hemholtz Schmoluchowski equation, and I'll show you that later and how you use it. It's a really easy, simple equation, but the applications are numerous. And 1924 renamed as zeta potential. Don't know why it had to be done. I thought it already was when you put the letter zeta to it, but it was, and that's history, okay? Um, charge formation, where does charge come from? So if we've taken a balloon before, rub it with a wool cloth, it gets all statically charged, right? That's basically it. That's all zeta potential is. You charge it, you rub it, it creates a charge. Now, how do you measure that charge? You put it over someone's head, hair stands up, there's a charge, right? You need a little bit more finesse for that. So um, why charges happen is as a result of a solid surface coming into contact with an electrolyte and it causes charges to form on the surface. Now, charge formation, that's probably not very clear. Charge formation will be due to either the dissociation or protonation, so depending on which ions move across, and the other one is adsorption of larger molecules to the surface. Um, here's a good picture to show you what that means. So typically we get functional groups like this. You've got your carboxylic groups, you've got your sulfonate groups, and those will have a net positive charge which they donate to the electrolyte, so you get a positive charge all around. You've got some of these which are amines which absorb a proton, so it results in a net negative charge, so that's what you get there. So that's like a hydronium ion and that you've got a hydroxide Ion. The other one is adsorption, so you get an ion that connects to the surface of a charged particle, changing how the surface looks when you measure it. It changes the net charge on the surface. So these are quite common things that happen every day. We use them quite a lot. We see them in most applications, so um, the easiest one for, for adsorption, I guess, is when you use a membrane. You use it for long enough, it, get, it gets fouled, you get a deposition of layers on the surface. That changes the charge of the surface. And that's an example of adsorption. Uh, cool. Zeta potential. So what is the zeta potential? It describes the surface charge of a solid when it comes into contact with the liquid, primarily water. All right, there are applications when you can put it in charge with a solvent, something that's nonpolar, but that's really complicated. Can be done, but not for today's scope. Um, surface with some molecules on the surface, you add water and then you get a net charge and then if you try to measure it, that would be the zeta potential, okay? That's just a diagram to explain what that looks like. So it's important to understand what happens at an interface and this is probably one of the big points is it is an interfacial pro property, yeah? So at the surface where a solid meets a liquid or a liquid meets another liquid, or a liquid meets a gas. So solid liquid, membranes, that's a really easy one, or even glass in water, or contact lenses, or, and so the, the next one would be liquid liquid, which are colloidal systems. So if you have um, oil in water emulsions, for example, or proteins, or micelles in water, things like that. The other one is foam, so liquid and gas, and that too would have zeta potential effects in it. It's really useful for your type of stuff, which is um, froth flow flotation. So being an interfacial property though, it's not so simple to measure because it all depends on everything that you're trying to measure. 
the property of the surface and the property of the liquid. You change any of these things, you change the zeta potential, which is why it's quite a finicky parameter to measure. In many times, it's not, a rel it's not an absolute measurement, it's quite a relative measurement, unless you control these parameters really, really well. Does that make sense? Yeah? So, now we talk about a few examples. What do I mean by property of the liquid? So you need a liquid which can carry charge. I think from most science experiments we've done in the past, if you try to dip electrodes, you know, the one where you try to create a circuit, Back in primary school, you have a bulb, you have a battery, and you have pure water, and then you put the two wires in it, and it doesn't conduct a charge. Why? Because it's pure water. It has no ions. So you try to salt it up a bit, and those ions are what give you charge, give you charge carriers, they give you electrons. So this is the case where we use pure water. We've, the water purity is one of the biggest factors. So you can't just use tap water. You need like RO water. And then you destroy it by adding in pure salt. But you've got to have really pure salt, no impurities, because again, the minute you start putting in just table salt, you've got iodine in there, you've got, you got other mag magnesiums, you've got sulfates, things like that. So you don't want that. So you want pure salt. So in the simplest case, you either add in potassium chloride or sodium chloride. Yeah? And in a solution, they dissociate. So we all know that. Is separate into potassium and chloride ions. So, this is a little video. It's, hopefully, it works. I wish there was music, but no. Well, there is, but. Everyone's deep in concentration. Look at that. <coughs> yeah, that's, that's all it is. The minute you can move, oh, it's going to go on a loop. OK, carry on. All right, so remember that video, because that's going to be what all this talk is about. OK, but now I'm going to introduce to you what's called the electrochemical double layer theory, and that's what it is. So uh, have we seen this before? Has anyone seen this before? Show of hands, who has? Good, good, good. Oh, there are, ooh. Good, OK. Um, is this useful in understanding how, how it works? Yeah? All right. So I will carry on and explain. Um, on the next slide. Can you see all that from the back? If you can't, you can come out to the front. All right, so the layer is divided into two, well, basically three, but there's two. There's a stationary layer, which is that one there, right in contact with the solid surface, and then there's a diffuse layer at the end. So the diffuse layer is where the charge carriers are allowed to move, whereas on the stationary one, all the charges are fixed, okay? And what separates these two is the shear plane. That shear plane is where you detect a zeta potential. All right, so if you had a look at that video before, you know how it pushed all those charges across? Those charges that could move are in the diffuse layer, correct? And so you would detect the zeta potential at the interface or the shear plane. Okay. An electrokinetic effect is what we're going to use to measure a zeta potential. So it is something mechanical, which causes shear of the charge, or something electrical that causes a mechanical movement. All right? One or the other. You must do one or the other to be able to have an electrokinetic effect. So it depends on the size and type of material. Obviously, if you have giant rocks, you can't move it. So you've got to sort of measure around it. If you've got colloidal systems, yeah, you can probably stream them across if you apply a charge, and then they would move, right? So again, observed at the interface between solid-solid, liquid-liquid, solid-liquid, liquid gas. Yeah? Uh, now, again, to observe this effect, the phases must move relative to each other. So one could stay still while the other moves, or they can both move in opposite directions. But you must have movement to be able to measure an electrokinetic effect. Whew, okay. 
these are the electrokinetic effects that we know of. I'm sure there are others, but I think these are the main ones. Electroosmosis, pretty simple. You apply a charge and the liquid moves. You put a membrane in between, you can create um, filtration type reactions. The opposite side, streaming potential. You apply a charge, sorry, you apply a movement and you detect a charge, right? Because it's either one or the other that must happen. And then underneath that, you got electrophoresis, where you apply a charge um, over a suspension with particles, and as those, par those particles are forced to migrate from one anode to the cathode or cathode to the anode. Sedimentation potential is the same thing, but you allow the force of gravity to make all these particles fall, and as they fall, you measure that movement as a charge. And the last one is where you sort of oscillate the electrical signals, like with an AC current, and then you can detect information about size, orientation, and things like that. This one, not so common, but, and we also don't talk about this so much, but this is a good guide as to the different methods that are available. Okay, so far with me? Yeah? How do you measure it? Or oh, what do you do to measure this? So, this is again just a summary of what I've just said, but you're forcing one layer to slide over the other, and then you want to be able to measure those charges, right? Um, and what you get is a streaming potential or a voltage. So if you have two electrodes and you have movement across, depending on how fast it moves or what pressure you apply on it, you get higher potentials. Depending on what concentration of charge you get going through it, you get more amps, you get more a lot more charge, yeah? You must have charge moving, because if it doesn't move, it's more capacitance, more than charge, more than amps and current, so you want current to be able to measure this. Um, okay, so again, imagine you have a tube or a pipe or a flexible membrane, so a hollow, a hollow membrane, so this is what this is. Uh, imagine the inner surface of the membrane or the tube has a net negative charge, and the liquid you put in it has a net positive charge. Uh, but what we're talking about is this positive charge is concentrated at this interface because that's the net charge there as a result of this combination, all right? You push it with pressure, you force it with a syringe, whatever, but you're gonna force that electrolyte through. What happens is you get movement of the charge, movement of the plus ions or the negative ions, and if you put electrodes on either side, you can measure the potential. So U in this case is symbol for potential, and STR is streaming, so streaming potential. And down here is a del P, is a pressure drop, because how do you make something move? You need a pressure. You always need a pressure drop, and that's gonna give you, so higher pressures would give you more potential. Yeah? Same thing, if you apply the force, you get a current. The current would be dictated by how many charges you get flowing across in any unit of time. Okay, I don't like equations, but I will have to show you this one because it's really easy. Um, this is how you calculate a zeta potential. All right, it's actually not that complex, and because a lot of these parameters you would get from either literature or you can measure it in your in your suspension. So uh, di streaming d del p, so that's the gradient of a current versus pressure drop curve. You multiply that, so this is the gradient multiplied by all this other stuff. So you got the, the viscosity of the electrolyte, that's easy enough to measure. The dielectric primitivity and coefficient you can get from literature or you can measure this as well. And then the most important part here is this parameter, the length, the dimension of your streaming channel. So now it's a thought experiment. Uh, if you were trying to do, f okay, maybe not froth because that's impossible to try to figure out what the shape is. So say you're doing um, powders. Okay, you wanna measure the zeta potential of a powder. How do you do it? You pack it into a little cylinder, you pack as much powder in, then you try to stream liquid through. You try to hope this powder doesn't dissolve, firstly, but how do you figure out what the pore size is and what channels it's going to do? That's quite difficult. You don't know what the streaming channel looks like. 
Okay, what's an easy one? Membrane. If you have a membrane and you squeeze that with another membrane, you've got a very defined gap. You can calculate the cross-sectional area and you have the length or the gap between the two, right? So that's an easy one and that's a hard one. But knowing that is actually really important because if you imagine you get this calculation wrong, your whole graph is off. It doesn't take much to really skew how the results change, right? So it's a really important to get concentration of your solvents or your solute correct, your salts correct, and your dimension. So this is for one where we know the channel cross-section and length. This is for the one where we don't. You just replace the last bit with the electrolyte conductivity. But it's also important to know what the pressure drop across that channel is because if you have powders with, a high vo with maybe a lot of voids in it, you might get a very low pressure drop. But if you got, oh, sorry, you have a question? Yep. That's just one what? That's the capacitance of the actual channel with the electrolytes. Then how do you account for the pressure drop? Yep, yep. Well, the electrodes measure capacitance anyway. So there's a few measurements that happen at the same time. That is a cross check. But you could, yeah, if you have sensitive enough an LCR meter or anything like that. Sure. Does it make sense for a solid surface or more for, co for colloidal systems? Yeah, okay. Uh, sorry, I was going to repeat the question, I guess, for the webinar is whether you could use capacitance 1 over C instead of the L on A. And it is possible, but it kind of depends on what your sample is and what you're trying to measure, I think. It is. This is easier, I think. This is a lot easier and faster as well. I'm pretty sure capacitance would change as you stream current through it. <laughs> or if you get depletion measurements or you get a adsorption happening. Whereas this stays the same as long as your sample doesn't deform or swell. This is good for samples that don't swell. If you have like Organic material or biomaterial that swells in the contact of water, that gap or the L or even the A will change as a function of time as it absorbs more liquid. So that's one of the tough ones. And so we've already done that. So this is good for things of irregular size. So powders, fibers, textiles, uh, hair, uh, skin that swells, so things like that. So this is, a, is an example of what a streaming potential curve would look like. So you've got streaming potential on the y-axis and you've got pressure drop or pressure difference on the x-axis. And so you want this curve to be nice and straight because it's so nice, right? You don't have to do you know, differential equations. You don't have to integrate over every point or anything like that. You just, that's a nice curve. And that's what we really get in reality, to be honest, with, with instruments that are that are designed to measure flat surfaces, this is what you get. Even with powder surfaces, if you, if you load them right, you can maintain a pretty good pressure drop. And that's what you want, because now that's a single number, it's a constant number, you just multiply that with all your other factors. So here's an example, if you're doing a adsorption process, so what does that translate to into real world measurements? Oops, sorry. Say you're trying to do you're trying to see the adsorption of PEI onto a silicon oxide wafer. So you would titrate just a small amount or a known amount into the suspension and you, you stream it across the surface and it would absorb, 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 and then it saturates. You get one measurement. You do the same, you go up to the next parts per billion, saturate, you see how it flattens off. That's the point where we take the measurement and then we translate this into a zeta potential as a function of added adsorbent, which is your PEI. All right, so this is not a zeta uh, this is not a pH sweep like most people would do. This is actually an adsorption uh, zeta potential measurement. All right, is it going to make more sense when I show you some applications later? But this is how you get zeta potential from a titration measurement, for example. 
So typical single point measurements look like this. So you have, I find a lot of organics have a very positive zeta potential and a lot of stuff with a static charge on it, like glass, for example, so always seems to be a negative charge. Polymers always seem to have a negative charge. So this thing here is a transition when you do an adsorption of, of a protein onto glass, it switches the zeta potential because you're measuring what's happening at the surface, right? Because there's a change. And this is actually a powerful point. We can use zeta potential to measure when adsorption has happened or when a surface has been modified where maybe other methods might not work or is too finicky. For example, contact angle measurements might be really finicky to do, or else this is quick and reproducible. Um, this is the one that most people do, is trying to sweep the pH as a function of the zeta, as a, and then trying to figure out where the zeta potential is. Uh, it's important for some applications, so, but the more important thing here is to introduce the concept of an isoelectric point is where the zeta potential is zero. So the pH at which the zeta potential of your sample is zero, that is called the isoelectric point, meaning it's got a net zero charge or no charge. So it's neither negative nor positive, it's right in the middle. Okay, so we talk about characterization techniques. The Solid samples we measure with the surpass and the light sizer we measure with uh, the colloidal systems we measure with the light sizer. Now there's a reason for this and we go all the way back to the slide about the different uh, kinetics or the different characterization techniques or electrokinetic effects. Streaming potential is when you force liquid over a surface and then you measure what happens. But if you're trying to make colloidal systems move, that's a completely different method. And so the sensitivity is very different, which is why they're built into different machines. Um, the reason I'm talking about this is you actually have one here. Do you know you have a zeta potential instrument for solid surfaces in this, in this building? Yeah. This building? Hands up, who knows this? Uh, uh, well, we, you, you sold it to him. Really? No one else knows about this? Oh, Javide's going to get a lot of emails. Call Javide and tell him that you would like to use it. So they have this instrument. It's one generation old, but it does everything that the new instrument does with a couple of differences. But I think he has one sample holder, mostly for membranes or maybe a clamping cell. Clamp and a plug. Okay, so he's got the clamping cell and the cylindrical cell. So this, I'll talk about this in a sec. So now that you've seen this, do you guys have ideas on doing measurements? No? Okay. So what is, what is the function of it? So it's to give you, so now it's kind of smaller. It's kind of the size of, um, I don't know, it's about this small now. Really small. Um, and it essentially uses a beaker with electrolyte that it pumps through the cell. It's got a titration system where you titrate either your acid or base, but for adsorption measurements, you titrate your concentration of whatever you want to adsorb onto the surface. So you control the volume that you're titrating in, and by knowing the concentration in that syringe, you know exactly how much is adsorbing onto the surface. Um, the electrodes are gold chloride electrodes, but we have, I think, platinum ones as well for different types of materials. I guess the real power of this instrument is to measure all kinds of solid samples. Okay, so ask Javed if your sample will work on his. But the cylindrical cell is, I think, what he has. What it is, it's just a glass tube. You shove in as much material, well, within reason, into the cell, and then you plug both sides with a, mem uh, with a filter paper, and you can measure liquid as it streams from one end to the other. So the instrument works by pumping liquid through the cell in one direction and pumping it in the other direction. So you get, hopefully, symmetry on both sides. Um, what it does is it knows the pressure drop across that because it's got electrodes, it's got pressure sensors, so it's quite an accurate instrument to measure this. You can put in powders, but it has to be larger than 20 microns. Anything smaller falls into the realm of, realm of being colloidal. You can do rocks, 
really good for flo uh, flocculation measurements. So you can have, say, powdered aluminum oxide or bauxites or red mud or whatever tailings you're trying to flocculate. You chuck that in there, and then you add your flocculant to see the point at which your zeta potential is zero. Then you know you've used up all your flocculant, all your active sites are gone, and that is your optimum flocculant dosage, for example. You could do the same with a colloidal system, but that's if you have really fine colloidal suspension settling. Clamping cell, good for, uh, oh sorry, for the cylindrical, you can also put fiber in, textiles, hair, cotton. Uh, clamping cell is good for large samples, like if you have silicon wafers, if you're cutting them out, you've got these big pieces, you can see what the surface potential is right there for a large sample. You can use giant blocks of glass, whatever it is. Adjustable gap cell, great for membranes, because you have two membranes, you squeeze them. So just like that image I showed before, where you had the pipe, you basically have two symmetrical membrane surfaces, and you stream liquid through. So our biggest market's actually for membrane research. It doesn't have to be water filtration either. It can be dialysis. It can be um, uh, separation of uh, organics from water or something like that. And then a couple of cool ones. So you can do contact lenses. Because contact lenses, I mean, I wear contact lenses and I know the exact point when, they're un when they are uncomfortable. And that's because you get a deposition of, a, of gunk on it. You get material that deposits, and you can measure that because when the surface changes, the zeta potential will change. But it's so like how do you how do you calculate the area or the cross-sectional area of the curvature of the eye? It's quite a complicated thing. So that's one application. Hollow fiber membranes also one that's quite interesting and flex. So that one's good for hemodialysis. So you got these bundles of HF fibers, and you can figure out what happens there because in some applications you get red blood cells depositing or clotting on the inner surface of hemodialysis membranes and that's a problem so how can you modify the surface of the membrane so that it doesn't clot on the surface and flexible tubings so so far so good we're going to talk about applications and after this I'm pretty much done so we're going to take a bit of time just to go through each application. If something sings out to you, put your hand up, all right? So where are the applications? All them. So membranes, biomaterials, semiconductors, fibers, cosmetics, polymer surfaces, and minerals. So here's one. I'm trying to use a ceramic disc or a ceramic material to filter um, viruses. So over here, you've got negative charges on the ceramic disc, and the viruses are negatively charged too, and that is the curve. Now, what do you reckon the rejection rate's going to be? I mean, the answer's right there. It's pretty poor. It's less than 90%. The reason for that is that all the negative re repels, so it goes right through. Nothing gets retained in the ceramic. So if you modify the surface of the ceramic, make it positive, you can pull and attract the viruses and hold them in the ceramic disc. Okay, that's one application. Now, try to get out of your mind that this is an absolute measurement because your ceramic disc is going to be different from that ceramic disc from that. But what you're trying to see is a change. You're trying to see a shift of the actual zeta potential for something that might be negative and you don't want it to be negative, you want it to be positive and this shows that. So this has become positively charged and it's improved your rejection of viruses. Okay. Uh, protein adsorption. So in some applications, you might, so a good one is maybe hemodialysis membranes, right? Where you don't want to see, so if you're trying to clean someone's blood, the last thing you want is for his blood or her blood to clot on the inside of that dialysis membrane and that clot gets sent back to him. It's like, that's not what they asked for. They came in to get well and now you've given them a stroke. So you want to figure out what's happening on the surface of those membranes that's causing this sort of reaction. So you can study this 
maybe what happens when you adsorb uh, bovine serum onto a glass surface that shifts the zeta potential and it's measurable. And so maybe this is not what you want, so you modify the surface so that you don't have this effect. How would you do it? So you fill one of those syringes with your BSA, known concentration, and then you say titrate, I don't know, two, two mils every minute. And so just drip, 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 drip. And it times it, and it measures the streaming current as a function of time. And this is just showing re reproducibility, just to show like, yep, we're getting the same adsorption onto the surface. Maybe you're trying to look at different materials. Maybe glass has some sort of um, behavior, and maybe titanium has a different type of behavior. But oh no, they have exactly the same behavior. So, because you can see that, this is titanium here. Uh, that's titanium there, and that's glass there. So logically, you think, yeah, they should reject BSA, right? Or one would have an affinity to the other, but it looks like they have exactly the same adsorption profile. And that's maybe interesting. This is a fun one. How useful conditioner is or shampooing is? Okay, because this one all of us can relate to. Um, so again, you titrate shampoo in, and you measure time. So you got time on the x-axis, you got streaming on the y. So when you titrate in, so nothing here, this is just the water or electrolyte streaming through hair. Yeah, and then you add your shampoo here, boom, streaming potential changes. It makes sense because you've changed the surface of the hair. And while that shampoo is in there, it's unchanged. And then you rinse it again with clean electrolyte and that drops off. It takes a bit of time and this might be useful to know how long it takes for that mass of hair to get all the shampoo out. And then you can put that on your shampoo bottle and say rinse for three hours or, you know, 10 seconds. Or how many rinses it takes. Right? And it's back down here to the original zeta potential of the hair. And that's good because you don't want this to leave your hair different. But then maybe you want your hair to be a bit soft, a bit silky, not so frizzy. Add conditioner and this completely shifts the zeta potential of the hair. And that is what you want a good conditioner to do, right? You want it to give you that, that silky feeling and not your hair frizzy as a result of the charge being different. Now, what might be more interesting is to see the time it takes for that effect to wear off when you should be washing your hair again. Same thing for fabrics. Um, wanted to see what the effect of fabric softener does. That's just the regular wash cycle, and then bang, fabric softener. Hits there, and then you rinse it. What you don't want to happen is that dropping back down, right? Because you've added fabric softener. I want my fabric soft. So it ends up there. And that's what you want. That means there's some sort of retention of whatever chemicals you're trying to adsorb onto the fabric, and it is there. But you can see it is dropping over time with how much water goes through. And that might be an interesting thing to do over a long period of time. This is more to show how you can track treatment of a surface as a function of treatment runs. So how much material you can deposit on a surface and can you detect a difference? So you might say I take a minute to put all to a minute to stream this material over and then I get this baseline here, one minute. Add a bit more, goes up, add another one, goes up, add another one, goes up, but you can see the rate or it plateaus a lot quicker and they're almost collapsing onto each other. So you might find you don't have to treat it so many times to affect that sort of deposition layer. This is um, kind of the same thing as you do with contact angle measurements because you can tell has the surface been modified enough that it's changed the contact angle of a droplet. This is another way to do it. So I'm not saying contact angle measurements are better than zeta potential or not. They're kind of complementary. You can use them as a self-check. Uh, same thing. So what you're using zeta potential for here is, has there been a change? Has my treatment method worked? Has it made a significant change to my product? Yes or no? And this test might take, well, this test will take a long time. The reason for that is you're going from 
pH 2 all the way to pH 10. If anyone's done chemistry before, you kind of titrate it from the, from the burette. You wait for the stereo to go. You wait for a color change. You put a bit more. This is all done by the machine, right? So it's detecting a, a change in the current. It's also got a pH probe in there, so it's waiting for the pH to stabilize. And it's all a self-controlled system. So it waits for stabilization of the pH before it puts more acid in there or more base. So it will take a long time, but at least you can just press go, walk away, and then you get a fairly good result to show whether there's been sufficient treatment done to the surface. Uh, Membrane performance is a good one, but I don't, well, this is just there for you if, if you want it. I didn't, I didn't want to talk about that one too much. It's, again, changing the surface, modifying the surface, and making sure that it works. What it leads into, though, is trying to figure out when your membrane's done. When is it completely fouled, and when do you need to do backwashing or back flushing? And that's a good one. So a clean membrane should look like that, where else a fouled membrane looks like that. Now if you did a, you could titrate in the foulant that you're trying to deposit on the surface and see the time it takes for your membrane to be completely saturated. And so then you go away and you modify your membrane surface and put that back in and see if over multiple uses, maybe the clean membrane and a fouled membrane look exactly the same. And that would be cool. Contact lenses. Exactly, it's almost the same graph, isn't it? But the difference is the new contact lens plateaus here, whereas the old contact lens after wear plateaus there. So why do you think your eyes feel a bit dry when you got bad contact lenses? A good contact lens should be hydrophilic, right? It should like to be in water. When it starts being dry, it's because it's actually repelling water. That's why you're getting a bit of abrasion between your lens and your eye, and that's what feels dry. So for this, it's looking like the effects make the contact lens less hydrophilic. And that's it. So summary, exactly 40 minutes. Um, what do you get from Zeta Potential? You get information about functionality, adsorption, and desorption. So Go away, think about it, and you might come up with a few ideas on what you could investigate with uh, the Zeta Potential technique. So we're looking at surface charge. So today I've only talked about surface charge, not colloidal stuff, because that's pretty well known anyway. I mean, I'm surprised no one knew we had one of these instruments here. So, but now you know. Um, it's important, it's really useful for surface modification and seeing the effects of what you've done, if it's really worked on the surface, what kind of washout effects you have, can you make any improvements to it for next time? Uh, I've talked about that. It's really important for membranes in water processing, semiconductor materials. Um, but I think the biggest takeaway message though is the quality of the water you use, the salt, and how you load the sample, how reproducible you, or how well you load the sample, that's going to affect how good your results are. So if you do a, if you say you do a measurement and you say, oh, mine are completely different from what these guys have published, the best way to check if what you're doing is correct is use a reference material. So something that's well characterized, like a polypropylene foil or viscose fibers. These have defined zeta potentials when you meet the criteria of, say, 0.001 mole per liter, KCL, uh, the water has to be of a certain standard, temperature, pH, and this is the zeta potential you affect. If you get that number, then you know your instrument's working, then whatever results you get on your real samples, that's just the reality of it. So for more information, you can get the zeta guide, which there are a few more in the front. So pick, pick one up. If you want more, go to the website, and you can order one. Uh, they'll mail it straight to you. There's also an Anton Power wiki page for Zeta Potential, so really nice, simple reading. Uh, you can go through. It's got all the information about it. It's really basic, though. It's a good starter kit. There's a lot more information in that Zeta guide on this. And we have application notes on all sorts of stuff that we can do with Zeta Potential. Just uh, send me an email. Uh, my email is ak 
at mep.net.au. Or you can maybe send Jenna an email, uh, Jane an email and she'll send them on to me. Also ask Javed because he's been using the instrument a lot and so he, he knows his stuff. Questions? So for the benefit of our people on the webinar, please, if you do have questions, please send them through on chat now. Um, and I will be using the microphone to ask the questions just for everybody. Uh, thank you for that, Ishish. That's all right. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to, I'd, I'd try to make it short, sweet and smart <laughs> yeah. so that we can get as, as many in. Uh, uh, I'm basically working on, on semiconductor devices uh -huh. and I wish to measure the, the static charge on the surface of semiconductor wafers. Uh, what I'd like you to suggest me is which technique would most probably suit me in, in terms of solid surfaces. And secondly, the techniques which we are using over here, whether the technique which we use, whether do, they do impact the amount of charge which we are measuring on the on the surface. Whether it impacts the charge. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I, well, I just like uh, whether, whether you guys have mm -hmm. considered the effects of a measuring technique affecting the the thing which we are measuring. Okay. Thanks. Um, the, the technique, what are you using now to measure it? It's basically uh, a, a, a semiconductor wafer. Uh -huh. And it is basically uh, a junction of uh, aluminum, uh, aluminum nitride, and aluminum nitride. What, what technique are you using to measure the surface at the moment? Nothing. Uh, well, well uh, I'm not into that. I, I wish to know how. I how you would, okay. Yep, it's this one. So Javed has the clamping cell for this. So what it does is you put a big wafer. What it is is imagine my hands the wafer. What you would do then is you would have a reference material over here because we have to create a channel. There's no point having two wafers squeezed together because that's just ridiculous. <laughs> so you have one and then you have a reference material. This is usually a polypropylene foil or something whose zeta potential is something known. So you'd measure the overall effect and minus the zeta potential of the polypropylene foil. It's, that's really basic. It's an oversimplification of what happens, but essentially you would create one side is your reference and one side is your wafer. And you'd stream liquid here across back out. So then you would control the gap right there at the junction where the polypropylene meets the wafer and you stream across. So exactly the same techniques we've mentioned here, but it's um, one side is a reference side. Uh, the result, so this is a big thing for us that we do as well. It, because um, you can also figure out how well, how clean your sample is as well, because when you create uh, silicon wafers, like this is a certain level of cleanliness that you're aiming for, and this might be a good, a good way to check it. The other question was whether it changes the charge on the surface. Removes charge. No, because we, the charge, what you're causing is, so the silicon wafer in air has a charge, but it's not really something that we can measure. When you put an electrolyte in there, if it's pure water again, it doesn't allow the charge from the surface to do anything. The minute you put stuff with electrolytes, the electrolytes move. Right, so the charges in the electrolyte is what moves, unless there's something on the surface that pulls like chloride ions in or potassium ions in, it shouldn't, it shouldn't pull it in because these are all semiconductor materials, right? So the active sites or even the size of the particles, they're not gonna be able to exchange sites or anything like that, no. I've never seen charge changing on a surface. Unless you absolutely wanted that to happen, no, not for silicon, not for wafers, not for semiconductor wafers. Uh, yep. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask you uh, if it's possible with uh, zeta potential to actually be able to sort of uh, measure charge density or charge distribution on a surface. 
so that you can be able to like sort of identify adsorption sites, especially if you want to introduce some kind of structure or a solute so that there can be like specific interaction with your with your solid something. Yeah, that's the question. Is that a second question or is that just the one? Yeah, just one question. Okay, all right. Sure. Uh, it's a good question. It's a tough question to answer because charge density is difficult to measure with this because what you're getting is a surface, this is the whole streaming channel. So it's a combined charge of what's in the liquid and on the surface. So charge density is going to be difficult, but what you can find out is just from a basic measurement, if you have samples of different charge densities, you can detect the differences at say single point zero potentials. So it's relative, it's really good at comparing different samples. So if you know the charge density on one, the zero potential will tell you if it's different or the same. It won't tell you as the absolute number, the charge density is this. So that's no good. Uh, so if you have a reference of what you know has a particular charge density and then the next measurement is higher, it might mean that it's got less charges or vice versa. Second one is active sites. Uh, that's, that's what we do with flocculation. So flocculation in the minerals industry, for example, if you use an anionic or a cationic polymer and you've got particles which have an either positive or negative charge, each of those anionic polymers you can measure from the molecular weight or from the charge density of those um, polymers. Once, so you start, so you can say you have the, the, um, the cylindrical cell, you put your powder in there, then you start, you measure the zeta potential at rest, it might be 25, say positive 25, whatever. Then you start putting your flocculin in and it takes over all of these active sites, right? So it starts covering I guess the concept we use is that it covers the whole sample, or whatever. So you logically, the zero potential should begin to drop, 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 drop until it plateaus. This means all the active sites are full, and you can say this is the exact dosage we need to fill all those active sites. That's one case, and then you get another sample and do the same thing, and it might say you need a different dosage, which infers active sites but there is no number that you can get from this that says it has 12 active sites or anything like that. Yeah? So um, from the web, we have a question. Um, for, for a fixed volume cell, so the size is certain, how much change of surface, cha surface potential are expected to induce the change of zeta potential? In other words, what's the sensitivity of the mm. instruments? Pretty high, depending on depending on what sort of pressures you're creating, right? So, what's the name of the Agnesca? All right. Um, so you can imagine if it's a if it's a channel, and what we're going to do is going to squeeze the channel or open it. All right. So if we're trying to achieve a certain pressure, we want enough pressure that we can create a nice linear drop, because we want to measure. I guess one of the things to show I might go back. This one here. So it doesn't make sense to do one measuring point or one pressure because you won't get a gradient, right? So you've got to do a few pressures to be able to get a nice straight line. So you want to start with a gap that's big enough that you can start with high enough pressure and go to a low enough pressure. So you want to get a nice range. Now the sensitivity then would mean, yes, you can get all the different points in the middle, but that's difficult to explain like what effect is it going to be directly. It's more to do with how sensitive your electrodes are because that electrode is going to be what is the sort of the resolution of changes in current or volts that you can realistically measure. So it's probably in the brochure, but that as the resolution it specifies is what is measurable. But you wouldn't change the dimension of the gap based on that. You would change the dimension of the gap to get large enough sample area and enough pressure points to be able to get the whole curve. So. Short answer is resolution that's in the brochure would be the resolution that you can get. 
Thank you. And again, um, they've been told that the calibration solution for these are quite expensive, and the actual standard solutions. Um, does that factor in? Uh, there, no. <laughs> uh, there are three things that you calibrate on this. There is a, there's a pH probe. There's a conductivity probe. And then there are the AgCl, so the gold chloride electrodes. These are the three things that you sort of have to maintain. Okay, the gold chloride electrodes, there's a kit that you buy. Actually, no, on the old one, there's a kit that you buy. On the new one, they're uh, kind of disposable. You just buy new ones when they run out. It's a deposit on the surface that has to be maintained. As they wear out, you rebuild them. Um, that's just a wear and tear thing. Now, for pH probes, everyone does a calibration. You have to. It's a pH probe. So in any pH probe or device you have, it says, all right, dip it into this, type in the number, what the pH says on the bottle, it waits for stability, and then does that. Yes, you have to do it. I don't think it's too expensive. Um, what people do is they buy cheap and cheerful big bottles of the stuff for seven and nine or something like that, and they use it once and they let it sit, and the next time they go to use it, it's like, no, no, it's still fine. It's not fine because you've let air get in there, and it changes what, you know, what's supposed to be a calibration standard, and it's not. So I don't think it's expensive. I think it's better to buy small sachets. We sell them, I think, as part of Metro. That is small. They come in a box, they come in small sachets of like four or three, seven, and nine or whatever, and you just dip them in, use them, and they're valid for a week, and then you throw them out and you calibrate it once every couple of months. I mean, that. Then you've got the conductivity solution, which you can make with salt. It's actually just simple chemistry or baking. You just add a known, it'll tell you the mass of salt that you add to this pure water. You mix it, and then you dip your conductivity probe in there, and then you press calibrate. So you can make that yourself. But the buffers you should buy from someone and spend that just a little bit more to make sure your pH measurements are correct. Okay, um, I've just been informed that the next seminar is outside waiting to come in, so we're going to have to decamp. Um, we're going to just move um, the afternoon tea outside, so please feel free to hang around and ask questions as you, as you feel free, uh, as you see fit. Uh, thank you to those who are on the web, you can now log off, and thank you for your attention. Um, anybody here who wishes to contact us, um, you can please contact me through ANFF. Um, you'll find my details on anff-q.org.au. So thank you for your attention, and we'll be setting up just outside the door. Thank you.